Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. A big welcome from Grow CFO today. I know we've got lots of people dialing in from all around the world. It's great to have you all here today. So I know most of you know me already. Of course, I'm Dan Wells, the founder and the CEO of the Grow CFO business. And um, see lots of people joining this session. Really looking forward to it. So hopefully you are all here today for an insightful hour on how to make automation of financial reporting a reality. Now, this is such a big topic in the community. So we're really, really looking forward to this day. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about this topic in detail. We're also going to be looking at Power BI as well. So thinking about you know, how we can be using the different cutting edge tools that are now available to us as the lucky people that are really in this revolution around finance and technology. So topic today is how to make automation of financial reporting a reality. Welcome everybody who's joined. I'm delighted to be joined by Ruben and Rebecca today. And um, Ruben, do you want to say a quick hello and just introduce yourself? For sure. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> great to uh, great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity, everybody. I'm Ruben. I'm the director of Acteris at for the European region, uh, where a software vendor for xp &E solutions, amongst other things, uh, keen to talk to you today a little bit about how you can use Power BI on its own uh, or with that terrace within uh, your environments. Great. Thanks, Ruben. And I've had the pleasure of speaking to Ruben many times on this topic. I know that he has many different insights. It's great to be working with Acteris today on this topic. So thank you very much. And Rebecca as well. We're joined by Rebecca Archer, who's also going to give that so important peer group perspective as a fellow finance leader. Rebecca, do you want to say a quick hello? Hi, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. So I'm Rebecca Archer. Uh, the finance director at Namende and uh, definitely a happy customer of using Actaris and Power BI. So looking forward to telling you about that today. Great. Thanks, Becca. So we're really looking forward to that. So the way we're going to run the session. So Ruben's very kind of kindly going to give us some leading industry insights on this topic about how you can make automation of financial reporting a reality. So we're going to start with a few really insightful slides from Ruben on that. And we're also going to run a poll as well to really get you in the mindset of thinking about this topic and just get an idea of where you are so we can pitch the content at the right level. Um, then what we're going to do, Becca's going to very kindly give us a peer group demonstration of the power of such technologies that we're going to be talking about today. So really bring into life how you can go and solve your problems, which no doubt you know, many, many of these technologies have helped Rebecca with. So Becca's going to be giving us that insight in the second half of the session. Now, most of you have probably experienced Zoom users, but in case you're not, please do use the Q&A function at any point. So you'll see that in the toolbar. Um, so feel free to ask questions. If it's relevant to the current slide, we'll pick up on it there and then. If not, we've allowed a generous amount of time at the end for questions. So we're really looking forward to that. But um, let's get cracking on the content. So Ruben, over to you. Perfect. Yeah, thanks again, Dan. Um, I'm going to keep it pretty, pretty basic from my side today. I've been working with Becca just over a year now uh, at Narmanen. She's got a great example of how she has worked to and used uh, Actaris and Power BI. And I'll kind of let her do uh, most of the speaking there in terms of the, the real use case, and I'm sure how it could apply to your businesses. But what I wanted to touch on first was just a little bit more broadly uh, around Power BI. And I will pick up with the first question, Dan, uh, just in terms of exposure to Power BI. So whether you've seen it, or using it a bit, you'd like to use it more, um, just a little bit of background. Was it regularly, occasionally, no, but you plan to, or no, uh, and no plans, basically. Um, and while I'm waiting for those uh, responses, I'll just take you a little bit through Actaris. It's just two minutes on Actaris to give you an idea of why we're interested in this space and why it's important to us. And then we'll get back to uh, Power BI uh, and its uptake and its utilization. So Actaris was founded in 2011. We decided Power BI was a great place to focus early on, and that's been a great bet, as you'll see throughout this kind of presentation. Typically and initially where a financial planning organization will help you to be able to plan better, and I can take you through kind of what that looks like. We've helped customers all around the world, all industries, all shapes and sizes. We featured in the Gartner Quadrant um, for the first time this year for financial planning. We were their cool vendor a year or so ago. We're pretty well reviewed if you Google us from kind of independent software review sites. Uh, and importantly, Microsoft actually licensed our technology specifically for uh, right back in Power BI 
the last year and is rolling that out now. That's a little bit of background on Actaris. If you want to know more about Actaris, please uh, reach out to me. Always happy to give you uh, more information or talk to you about your specific requirements. But in terms of uh, getting back on topic, uh, in the case of Namine and the case of Power BI, these are all problems that I'm sure you're very familiar with within your organizations in terms of complex sources, integrating them, really a heavy reliance on Excel uh, as much as we try and move away from it across the board, whether it's for source integration, whether it's for budgeting or whether it's for maintenance perspectives. It's always still having problems with different solutions for different bits and pieces, purposes, particularly with SaaS solutions these days. Uh, you can have a few different systems operationally, uh, for different areas of the business, as well as perhaps your general ledger, as well as budgeting. And even for smaller businesses, it becomes difficult to bring them all into one place. Um, that, of course, leads to problems with uh, difficulty maintaining the solution. And whilst Excel is pretty good for doing lots of things, it gets difficult for a few other things, amongst them data storage, uh, more real-time simulation, multi-user benchmarks, top-down, bottom-up planning, that kind of stuff. So for these reasons, there are a whole bunch of different xp &A solutions out there these days, of which Actaris uh, is one. And what we're focusing on is using Power BI to be able to uh, basically solve the majority of these problems. Now, Power BI is a great tool. It's relatively new. It's been around since about 2015. Uh, and it sits on the back of a lot of other Microsoft technology, Microsoft SQL Server, Microsoft Analysis Services. So at its core, it's got some pretty... Um, mature technology that is bringing into a user interface that is very easy and powerful for business users um, to use. Can I just grab the results, Dan, of that first poll? Or can I see them somewhere here? All right, pretty, pretty good split there. Um, and this is typically what we see. It's rare that organizations are using it regularly, even though they might intend to. There's a follow-up question, uh, which we might pop up now, um, Dan, but we can see that 12% regularly, 30% occasionally, 32% no, but plan to, and 27% no, and haven't used it. So that's about 70% that either plan to or are using. And we're seeing that increasing, particularly uh, notable for a tool that's only been around um, since 2015. So while that new question um, <clears throat> is popping back up, so is Power BI on your organization's roadmap? Yes, it's a priority. Yes, not immediately. No, we're considering other tools. And no, again, uh, it's not um, on our plans. So Actaris is interested in Power BI. Um, and Power BI is now a great tool for businesses with 70% of you guys using it now. But what is Power BI? It's effectively a data visualization tool. But like I said before, it sits on top of SQL Server from an architecture standpoint and analysis services from a calculation standpoint. So not only is it a very flexible reporting tool, but it's extremely powerful from a data connectivity point of view. It's very easy to bring in either existing spreadsheets, either in isolation or from a shared drive, as well as other data sources. Actaris, for example, have a zero connector, but there are connectors out there for a whole range of different source systems through from CRMs, ERPs, uh, and other databases. So it's very easy for an end user to increase their data connectivity and bring all of this together into one interactive dashboard. And this is obviously a fair bit of the challenge uh, of being able to <clears throat> automate your financial reporting. A big part of it is getting the information into the right place. Now, once it's there, there's some um, processing you need to do around that. Again, there's a few kind of um, ways that you can look at doing that. But the next piece that's particularly important um, for Actaris is then the planning and budgeting bit. And that's where we take Power BI. We take this powerful tool with great data connectivity, great interactive dashboards, and enable you to budget and plan within it. And even if you're not using Actaris, Power BI is an incredible place to be able to aggregate your data and bring it into one place. And that can definitely then form part of your budgeting process <clears throat> independently and on its own. Just wanted to touch again quickly on the uh, roadmap, basically, and how uh, fresh Power BI is. So 2015 was the first release. Um, Power BI desktop was a year later. Premium and mobile came in place 2018 and 19, uh, and then 2021 saw some more improvements. Notably, at the end of 2022, AI-powered features came in. Copilot for Power BI is incredible. If you haven't used it, uh, have a play. If you don't have it available, go and look at a YouTube video. You can basically speak in pretty much plain language about what report you want to design, what data you want, and how you want to interact with it, and Copilot will build it for you. Uh, it's a massive... Um, advancement in terms of ease of creating these reports if you're not familiar with the interface still requires you to have the underlying data there 
it is getting better at using Copilot to be able to interact with the data source and transform it. Um, still coming, um, but definitely in process as well. So if you haven't, check out what you can do with Copilot and Power BI. Uh, it's very impressive. Along with this pretty impressive adoption, and worth noting as well that Microsoft release updates of Power BI every month, uh, and they're fairly significant. So it's always improving and improving quickly. Uh, and if you haven't used it very much and you're used to Excel and you're used to Googling how to do something in Excel, how to build a macro in Excel, the online help that's available even outside of AI and help is pretty uh, exceptional. So, you know, you're not alone. There are other people doing the same things. It's pretty easy to work out how to build what you need to build with a little bit of playing around. Admittedly, DAX, which is the programming language of Power BI, can be very complex. It came from Microsoft Analysis Services. So you can get a bit stuck up in more complex measures and how you achieve things. But doing the basics, manipulating reports is fairly easy. And if you can get help from someone uh, in terms of configuring those rules initially, or having someone to reach out to, you need a little bit of extra assistance. It's a tool that you can very much uh, own otherwise within the finance department. So there's currently over 100,000 companies using Power BI as of earlier this year. Uh, and that's just uh, growing more steadily. I'm sure we'll see from the Power BI roadmap that there are some people in here for whom it's a priority uh, or for whom are moving forward. Just wanted to touch on quickly. So 35% is a priority, 43% yes, but not immediately. So that's 78% yes, it's happening. 10% uh, with other tools and 12% not in their plans. And again, this is similar to what we're seeing across the marketplace. The organizations that aren't using it uh, are moving that way pretty quickly. It's a great tool to learn. Uh, the learning curve is pretty fun and for accountants or for systems accountants or even for uh, non-qualified accountants in the finance department, IT as well. It's a great tool with a great learning curve and you can use it across the organization for lots of different purposes, not just within finance. Just wanted to quickly show you some of the traditional Power BI use cases, which I'm sure you've seen. Uh, it's basically known for you know pretty dashboards um, and lots of kind of fancy graphs, but it does also have really good tools for being able to um, create reporting structures and create navigation structures, defining the right reports for your end users. And then from that Actera perspective, we take the same functionality and we enable you to actually write back within um, the data. And that's what Beck is doing in Harmonix. So I'll let her take you through how it's occurred, but just to show you um, quickly, not sure if you can see my slide still down uh, or whether. Uh, yeah, we can see that, Ruben, yes. It's still the slides or it's the uh, demo? I can see the demo slides now. Okay, perfect. So this uh, within browser, is a Power BI report. And we can see on the left-hand side, we've created some navigation structures. This is all the standard Power BI. Uh, Power BI is basically uh, a blank canvas uh, and you can set it up in whatever way you like, in terms of navigation structures, menu structures, uh, drop-down uh, slices, they're called in Power BI, navigation buttons for next page. So again, very flexible in terms of what you can achieve, even from a, just a reporting or analytics standpoint. But what I wanna show you quickly, because it features in Becker's uh, demo is the Actaris visuals actually take the Power BI interface uh, and enable you to actually write it back. So if I change this number and I save it, I've changed the value for a particular product for July. So we'll be able to see over here on the left-hand side, the report updates and July changes. Basically, Actaris makes Power BI two-way, so you can actually capture user input. A typical use case for this is financial planning, um, but there are heaps of other use cases you can imagine as well. We can use it to capture numerical information. We can capture product-based information. You can choose the layout and the design of the reports that you have uh, with complete flexibility. You can capture commentary at uh, any kind of level that you want. We basically let you write back to a database. So whatever structure you want to take, you can take your Power BI layout and you can write back to that in real time uh, in a multi-user environment. So on the right-hand side here is an example of editing the product dimension. We could use this to have a commentary as well, or workflow status, um, or any kind of additional information there. So I just wanted to quickly show you what that portion of Actaris looks like in terms of how to use Power BI for write back. Um, otherwise, then I'm going to hand over to Becca, who can actually take you through the purposes of this and how it's been utilized from their side, 
Um, but like I said, Power BI is an incredible journey. I'm really glad to see that a lot of you are pretty interested in moving forward with it. If you have any questions about it or want any advice, please reach out to me or Hanak Terrace. If right back is interesting, uh, please reach out as well. Otherwise, uh, thanks for your time. Uh, I'll be around for questions at the end. And Becca, I will hand over to you. Cool, thanks Ruben. Uh, I shall just share. Oh. Great. So um, thanks for that Ruben. And, and I was reflecting on those polls, it was really interesting. So I think it's fair to say that I, as of the beginning of last year, sat in the bulk of where most people on this call are sitting now, which is, it was in the roadmap but I hadn't used it. So um, when you're all sitting there um, considering that, that was where I was. So here we are. Um, so I'm gonna talk about it from um, a client perspective. So of course we have implemented Power BI with Acteris in the last year. So if I sort of talk about, about myself to start with, um, so I'm a senior finance professional. Um, I've had a lot of experience with change management and I have a fundamental work, you know, I generally, sit on an improvement focus basis so there's always a better way there's always a more efficient way there's always a simpler way um my background is actually that i'm very much a finance generalist so i started an audit i uh qualified and i moved into group finance and i worked my way up to um the group finance director level and and in that journey i never did a system implementation People in my team did, we were acquisitive, we, in, we integrated systems as we went along, but I never actually led it myself. Um, so I came into this role in NAMIN at the beginning of last year, and um, the role was actually centered around the implementation of a consolidation reporting and forecasting system. And so, you know, that was my main objective and then everything else sort of felt, fell in around it. So a little bit about Namene. So we sell solar powered lights to communities in Africa who live off grid. So it's pretty unique. We are selling to, <laughs> it's quite a difficult way to sell. It's quite difficult to get to these customers, but they massively value the product. We are taking clean technology to these places in Africa. And from a finance perspective, it's quite complicated. We each, the sale of each light has actually got two revenue streams. We sell to the consumer. Um, so that's a heavily discounted price, around $2, because they wouldn't be able to afford it otherwise. And then what we do is we then, um, that light that's then sitting in that person's hand is actually generating a carbon credit. Um, that light has replaced a kerosene lamp. And in doing that, we're reducing carbon emissions, and therefore we are generating carbon credits. And so we're actually a carbon credit production business and we are um and those carbon credits we're selling to corporates um as part of their ESG agendas or as part of their um ambitions to achieve net zero. So we are fairly complex for our size. We have 12 companies across seven countries and therefore seven currencies. Um, but at a company level we're fairly simple. You know, each entity in its own right is relatively simple. So we use zero for every company. But of course, the complexity comes when you try and consolidate that information. Uh, when you report on it, when you're doing forecasting at that group report, um, that group level. Clearly, we have complexity around our revenue stream. So um, both um, the product sale and then the subsequent carbon credit obviously gives us complexity around cost of sales recognition and release. And by the nature of what we do with all our multiple countries and currencies, of course, we're subject to foreign exchange um, and therefore that needs tracking. Now, I could have wrote this thinking it was just about us, but actually I think every, every business these days has a lean finance team. Um, but my challenge was how can I significantly improve what we're delivering, how what we service um, the business from the finance perspective while remaining lean? Um, we needed to achieve a high return on investment. And again, you know, we are, um, you know, in our startup with scale up step phase. So of course, everything's constantly evolving and we have to remain nimble. So the system needs to be scalable and move with us. Finally, of course, um, you know, as is the way we all need efficient 
accurate, timely reporting, um, both in-house decision making, but also, you know, to show our investors we're credible and that we have, you know, good control of our finances. So how has Acteris worked for us? So I see Acteris as a rules engine. Um, it holds data and it applies rules to those data, to that data. So the solution itself is off the shelf. So we experience and enjoy, you know, the Power BI updates that come in automatically, the Acteris updates that happen. So it's off the shelf, but having said that, the data and the reporting structure are both bespoke to Namine. So we have then designed it to suit our needs. Um, as Ruben mentioned, so the API links we've got from zero into Acteris, and then there's API link from Acteris into Power BI. And so therefore that flow of data is all automated. So once you've set up your reports, once you've set up your rules and your mapping, that all just happens automatically and therefore it's quick and error free. So that's, I guess, the theory. What does it actually look like? What's interesting, when I saw Ruben's Power BI slide, I almost didn't recognize it was Power BI. It's fascinating that you're right. You can make it look however you like. So mine looks a little bit different, um, which is no bad thing. Um, so in terms of um, the outputs, so this is the actuals and forecast side. So from a finance report point of view, as with many companies I've you know, worked with previously, we have a group finance report, it's 35 pages. I've got a division finance report, 13 pages. And they include actuals, forecast, variances, group, company, cost center, PL, balance sheet, cash. So, you know, the whole suite of data all flows through into these finance reports. There are actually only two reports, and yet I then use row level security to give access to the right people to be able to see the right information. So, of course, the group report has got access to, you know, the board level, the chief exec, the C suite. But actually, from a country director level, there are three, and they all have access to the one division finance report. But I've set row level security so that each country director can only see their respective country. Um, there aren't that many of us, so I've actually done it by individual. But as long as there's a data category, you can then assign the security to it. So I've actually done it one company where some people can see revenue, whereas other people can see payroll. And that's done by person within one company. Um, the data input is automated. So all those 35 pages plus the 13 pages is all automated. And every month, the preparation time for those two reports is 10 minutes. Um, so this is, now see, I can't do a demo because my database is obviously confidential. So here is some screenshots of the June report, um, obviously with the data hidden, I'm afraid. Um, but you can see along the bottom. So along the bottom, you've got your different tabs. Now, this is the desktop Power BI version. Ruben was showing the online workspace version. Um, so this is where I make my changes. But effectively, I've got a tab for every page. You can see this is one is for the KPIs for Zambia. And you look along the tabs on the bottom, you can see there's a PL versus forecast, the PL uh, by department, which is cost center, PL by month, PL by per unit. So um, all my different tabs of presenting different visualizations. And then, so in this page specifically, I've got uh, the left-hand chart is number of units by month. So this is a stacked bar with the stack being the channel. So the sales channel, you can see the three criteria. And then I've got the, the time trend along the bottom. So for this, it's actually 18 months. So every month um, I just add an extra month on the end. And then the right-hand chart is um, uh, revenue and cost per, unit. So this is again a stacked chart, um, but it's got the costs. It's like by cost category by month across the line. And then there's a revenue per unit um, line graph. So we can see how we're tracking from a results perspective. Um, now, if you look at the right hand side of here, you can see there are um, uh, there are three little uh, it says data visualization and filters. So these are panes that are currently hidden. And here are the panes now shown. Um, and these are the measures that Ruben was referring to earlier. So I wanted you to show, so this is the DAX syntax, uh, you know, NAMINE, GC, MT, I mean, you know, there's acronyms in there. Um, 
basically it's month cost per light is cost divided by lights. So when someone's done one, you can then do another one. You can, you know, plagiarism is brilliant. So a lot of the key ones were set up by the Actaris consultant when he set me up originally, and I can now create um, subsequent measures. You know, I could now change that from group currency to local currency or, um, you know, do a different measure if I wanted to. And therefore you can create these new measures. And then, so that's the right-hand one. So the data column, the data pane is where you then create your measure. And you can see there are lots. And then the next one along is visualizations. So you can see, I mean, the number of different visualization options is extensive. Um, and actually there's a whole online world of um, visualizations you can add in. So if the Power BI ones, the standard ones aren't good enough, you can then go online and you can um, buy them very cheaply or they come for free and you can add on more visualizations that might be in a different PNL format or something. Um, and below that, then you then drag your measures across into those little fields. So the X axis, it says year month. I could change the type of, um, you know, that could be just year or it could be by quarter. I can change that quite easily. And again, so you just um, drag your measures in your um, dimensions across into those boxes and that sets up your visualization. And then the last one to the left of that is the filters. So if you want to sort of do final refinement. So for this right hand visualization, I just want adjusted operating profit. So I want revenue and costs that are above adjusted operating profit. So I've actually excluded other finance costs. You can kind of see the little button there. Um, so it's just showing, I didn't know how to do this a year ago and now I am building visualizations like this and it's straightforward. And then the final one I just want to share in terms of um, the finance outputs is the cash flow. So this cash flow is fully automated but you can see it's sort of designed on the Namine basis. So I I wanted it a direct cash flow. I mean, obviously for corporate, you know, static reporting, we usually do an indirect cash flow, but, you know, it was more important for us to get a direct one. So um, that's simply a mapping from the chart of accounts through, I'll show you in a second how it actually builds up, but effectively you get this automated output and you can see it's designed to us. So I've got on there climate certification costs. That's our investment in the, um, carbon credit programs, which of course is unique to a carbon credit producer, you'll all have your own specific um, measures or you know um, headings that you want to be calling out on here, and you can just design it based on whatever you need. Um, oh, now I meant to call out. So on this one, you'll see in the top right hand corner, it says current month June. And I say everything is automated, even that little text is a visual that is automated. So I said earlier, it takes me 10 minutes um, to do the month end process, the roll forward of the reports. So I wanted to show how I do this, which is a bit of an odd screen to be showing on a webinar like this, but effectively this is the, the engine of the reporting for my roll forward. So every visualization in my 35 pages, in fact, you can see we've got to the right-hand end of my report. So there's page 33, which is Zimbabwe balance sheet. Um, this next tab is settings, and this is hidden. So I've got a little hidden icon, so it doesn't actually get published. So no one else sees it. But effectively, my roll forward each month is I go into my settings page, and every visualization links to one of these time series. Because, of course, the thing that actually changes each month is time. You add on another month, you replace the month. So I literally go in here. I change my, so I add on my cumulatives. I've got my year to date, there's month, my balance sheet, I actually show a different set of months. I might do that quarterly. So I have a little, um, a different set for that. So I go through here and I just add July to them all, or I swap June for July, save, close, upload onto the work workspace, and it's done. And literally every visualization has updated and that's all I have to do. Now, I just want to show in terms of, um, the bottom up. So of course, what all of that, all I've just showed is sort of the output side. Well, what's the input? How do you actually make that happen? Um, so this is an extract of our, now these are called dimensions. So the data sits in a cube, that's where all the numbers are. The dimensions are the attributes that you then tag your data with. So this is the main dimension that is where, where a, the API for zero comes into Acteris. So the left-hand side is my company and my account code structure. 
And then you can see the columns along to the right, these are my different attributes or my mapping that I then set so that then these are the rules that effectively then the data then is following. So I just want to call out, you know, the right hand two, I've got intercompany. Is this balance an intercompany balance or not? So there's my balance sheet. Intercompany balances, yep, they get yes. And if they're not, then they're no. So then I can do specific intercompany reporting. And then there's the cash flow mapping. So all those headings on that previous cash flow report are actually those. And that's where it says movement in this account in the month map to that cash flow line on my report. And it just happens. And of course, then I spot I need to, um, you know, sometimes I need to align it because I realize the numbers don't quite work, but actually then I can go back in here, change it for whatever's needed, or if the business changes, I can add some categories and then I then refresh it and we're done. So then I just wanted to touch a little bit about the forecasting. I know Ruben showed the, um, uh, the, the right back in Power BI on the workspace, but just from my perspective, again, so I use Actaris and Power BI with the right back functionality for our forecasting. So we now forecast um, in Actaris, the latest one is out to June 25, and I've got a model. So I have input pages for uploading the data and then the output reports. So the same as those finance reports, I have 35 output pages on my forecast model and they're all automated. Um, again, so I can add new pages. So actually, if I realize, oh, we needed to look at any local currency, I then can just create a new page, add the visualization in um, and change it use the different um, measure and then swap the measure from local currency to group currency. So when I've made a change, press refresh and it all flows through and I don't have to worry about the mechanics. So what does that look like? So Ruben showed the workspace version. This is the desktop version of the right back. Um, and I just want to show there's not much that happens in this, but this is effectively the company. And because we're in zero, for those of you who use zero, we've got two tracking categories. So that's in here as well. So department is like cost center that's at the top and one of the slices but then you can see down the left hand side they're all our um tracking category two so we track sales segment tracking so there's our different countries on there so then when we're doing our right back it's actually at the zero transaction level so that then you have that continuity of information and then the final slide from me this is then one of the outputs on my forecast reports and again you'll see all the tabs along the bottom multiple years multiple currencies some are graphs some are tables um and this is my pnl so again we have a bespoke pnl to us and i've shown that actually there's a slicer here by department so if you just wanted to see what are the finance costs for the whole group in group currency by account code you just select department finance and then the whole finance forecast will be in front of you um or you can have the group and then you can use your the left hand breakdown. So this has got granularity down to account code. It then goes down to organization. Um, so you can then see it by company, by account code, and then all the way down and all the way back up again to a high level summary PL. So I believe we'll now um, open the floor, if you like, to questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ruben and Rebecca. What inspiring slides they were and incredible how you've managed to get what can be so much effort for the whole financial reporting cycle down to 10 minutes. That's really powerful, powerful stats, especially the complexity you have in your business. So well done. Um, Ruben, I'm going to ask you to just sort of explain the answer to a question you just gave um, regarding the difference between the offline and the online versions and how they kind of sync together as products. Do you want to just talk through that, if that's okay? Yeah, for sure. I can expand on that a bit. So the question was uh, asking the difference between the version of Power BI that I was displaying, which is the Power BI web service, which is just accessed in browser and it's fairly uh, cross-browser compatible, and the Power BI desktop application, uh, which Becca was showing the screenshots from. Um, the Power BI web service has become, like most web services, uh, much more powerful recently. You can do almost everything you can do in the desktop client. But traditionally, the desktop client is where you do more of the report editing, designing, building. Uh, and then particularly for multi-user situations, you would deploy it to the web service, which is easy than it sounds. You just press publish. Um, and then you can basically do the same reports. The interface looks pretty similar. 
Um, they access the same databases in the same way. So in Power BI, uh, there's a couple of ways you can access data sources. Um, the most common is import mode, uh, which means Power BI will query the data source, whether that's your ERP or some Excel sheets or the Actiris database on a regular basis, and then it will cache the results of that query. Um, so what that means is when you're viewing the reports in either the Power BI web service or in Power BI desktop, it's not querying the database, it's showing you the cache of the reports. But in answer to the question, both the uh, browser-based version and the desktop version uh, do it in the same way. Um, one little extension on that is that if you're doing write back uh, in Power BI, then you want that data source to be in direct query mode. What that means is every time you look at the report, it's querying the database directly. Because if you write back a change by increasing the product number or some commentary, and someone else goes to view the report, you want to be viewing the report directly. So uh, long educational answer, but both access the data in the same way. Great. Thanks, Ruben. And thank you for that question. Um, another one is it's interesting, actually, because I suspect most of us in the finance world are constantly thinking about Excel spreadsheets. So it's good to have a question on that topic. And I think I'm going to ask Becca this, but Ruben, chip in if you wish. Um, can Excel files be a source of input? And indeed, do they need to be? Uh, so, yeah, you can certainly use Excel. I mean, in terms of um, how I use it. So when we're doing our forecasting, you know, I have spreadsheets. Like I haven't stopped using spreadsheets. So I use spreadsheets for the calculations of, you know, the interest on the debt or the, um, you know, the consulting costs, you know, we know which consultants we're going to have. And, you know, I map that out in spreadsheets. What's then very neat is actually um, there's a bulk upload feature in Actaris. So uh, one of the buttons on that, um, the Actaris ribbon of the Actaris. So the Actaris has an Excel add-in. And through that, you can then do a bulk upload into your database. So when I've got my, you know, consulting costs by month in a nice spreadsheet format, I actually can just upload the data from the spreadsheet straight into my um, forecast database and then I just press refresh and then I can see it in my reports so you can either use it that way there is actually I mean Power BI itself I suspect Ruben this was probably for you you can actually just upload data straight from a spreadsheet into Power BI um, I don't use it for that I don't know if you want to touch on that side uh, no well well answered uh, yes Power, Excel can be a data source um, directly um, for Power BI, and in fact, uh, Excel files on a SharePoint drive or something, and that tends to be a way that people try and get information from Excel into Power BI earlier on. Um, as Becca mentioned, Excel can also be uh, a window into the data directly. So uh, using Excel, rather than storing the data in Excel, storing the data in Power BI, querying it through Excel, so it's always the correct, uh, it's the most live, up-to-date version, uh, and being able to write back to it as well, which you can do um, through Actera. So uh, you can definitely still use Excel uh, and we'll end up still using Excel to a degree for a while, probably. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, lots of questions coming in. So thank you. Do please keep sending them in. Um, so a question from Brendan, can you use formulas in the write back functionality or do you manually need to enter values? Who wants to pick that one up? I can answer that one. Um, so for the visuals that you saw that I displayed and that uh, Becca had, that they were blocked out, um, you can't enter formulas. Uh, there are other visuals um, that kind of ref, like replicate Excel-like functionality in Power BI, in which you can. Um, and if you're using them, you can reference standard Excel functionality. But no, in the, in the, in the visuals that were displayed, you need to either enter or paste the values in. I think it's okay. worth saying there is a way of automating it as well, though, because I know I've used it where you, you know, you know what you want for the next however long. So there are clever little things in there. You know, there's a repeat one and there's an add on 100. And so you can increase it by a percent. So there's a there's um some functionality actually in the right back um, page where you can just do I 5% or I5, I think it is, and it increases it by 5%. So you can actually just amend the numbers that are there by a um, a ratio or whatever as a um, shortcut sometimes. That's true, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you, Ruben and Becca. Um, in terms of a couple of various questions about implementation and integration, which we were expecting plenty of these. So, um, so firstly, for Ruben, how does the bigger picture look in terms of you know, using Actiris alongside Power BI, alongside an accounting software such as Xero? How, how do they all fit together? 
Um, so it depends on the accounting system, and more importantly, it depends on the health of the data in the accounting system or ERP. So zero is one we have a direct connector for, uh, which Beck is using, uh, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, at least the connecting is straightforward. You log in, you log into zero, you click authorize, and then Actaris pulls the data from zero through an API into our uh, Azure SQL database and you get the Power BI report that's ready to go out of the box. And again, it depends how healthy your data is and how useful that is to report off immediately. We do have connectors for a range of other systems as well. Um, they're available on our, on our website. Um, but also, at the Actaris architecture is just underlying is on a Microsoft Azure SQL database, which is very easy to integrate with. Most ETL pipelines or ETL tools will integrate with Microsoft SQL Server. Um, so if your organization has some sort of ETL pipeline in place, <clears throat> it's easy to integrate with. If not, we've got a bunch of connectors um, that can help you out with those initial steps. Um, certainly, if you're interested, reach out to us. We can always have an initial conversation, see what your system is, connect to it, let you know kind of what the health is, sort of how, uh, how easy it is. If it's a like zero, three-click situation, uh, you know, further up the spectrum. Great. Thanks, Ruben. A couple of people have asked about QuickBooks. We have a QuickBooks connector as well, likewise to zero. So very similar functionality to what uh, Becca has displayed today. Okay, thank you for those questions. Thank you very much. And um, Becca, a couple of interesting ones actually. I know we touched upon some of this when we spoke in preparation for this session the other week. Um, firstly, interesting question there. So how, how long did the implementation take to kind of get everything up and running? I imagine you've probably iterated a bit over time, but how long was that initial period and then how did it kind of translate into the ongoing sort of monthly incremental improvements yeah sure so the um so what was it so we signed contracts in march and the first deliverable output was actually in um about four weeks later when we did our first actual financial results in power bi and i presented the march month end numbers to the board so after four weeks of signing contracts, now it was pretty speedy and it was just actuals. But what it meant is it got very quickly a Power BI report in front of the stakeholders. So that was a really good, quick win. Then um, the next stage was then the forecasting, which actually was a much bigger project. Um, it required, because um, obviously that act, just getting the actuals through, like Ruben's just talked about, is actually quite straightforward forward you know there's the connector already exists you just have to set up some rules just um and then you know it all kind of just magically appears i mean with some report building um the forecasting itself actually then took a lot longer because we had to then model effectively we had to model all our journals to then map them into the logic in actaris in order to get those rules set up to be able to build those forecasts with those um linkages so actually i've now got a forecast model where i input units and i input the price and the cost, and then the model does all of the um, revenue and cost of sales. And, and there's intercompany in that as well. So we've now linked it. So when you put in the order from one company, it then sells it through automatically through to the other company based on time, fixed times. So there was actually a really big project then to do the forecasting. And at the same time, I was then got, I ended up distracted by the day to day. So having, um, you know, discrete resource to deliver on the project is so important. And I just, I got distracted and it slowed the project right down. Um, so yeah, so I guess I would say it took a year in total, but I did something quickly after, you know, a month or so. And then the forecasting was maybe three, four, five months. Then I was distracted. And then I've then, I would say I finished it maybe um, three months ago, two, three months ago when I finally got my forecast, um, my group forecast cash flow finished. So, you know, you start with PL, then you've got your balance sheet, and then you've got your cash flow. And I had to get all the way through to the end. Um, so that as a total probably was somewhere between 12 and 15 months. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Becca. I, I hope you took some time to celebrate. It's certainly a big, big effort to that. But it's interesting to hear that you had some pretty instant results from it, you know, in terms of that time saving benefits, which is certainly the experiences that we are hearing across the community so thank you for sharing that um similar question but slightly off piece so um in terms of you know we've talked a lot about the power bi system we talked about the Actira system yeah you know, had, had you just tried to do it alone in power bi what would the limitations have been 
So I don't think you can do what I've done in just Power BI because you have to have the rules. So the, the Actaris is the black box, which does the rules of the Forex, um, the consolidation, identifying into company, the mapping in terms of the different P&L levels. So I think if I had just zero Power BI, I'm sure you could get some systems accountant to do some direct thing. I'm sure that might exist somewhere, but actually you then lose the benefit of all of the, the black box of data and the organizing. Actually, we've been talking about data storage. The thing that one of the things I'm really appreciating is that um, the data is now organized. I know what there is and I know where to go and find it. And so instead of worrying about all these spreadsheets and you're never quite sure which folder they're in and whether they were from a subsidiary and have you got them all, I know now I can look at my data in all these different perspectives and it's all there. The data is all there. You can see how it flows through and you can see how it adds up and you see how those rules apply. So I couldn't have today what I, yeah, through just zero and Power BI. Thank you. And uh, that, that's really helpful. I'm sure a lot of people were wondering that. And Reuben, anything you wanted to add be, being an expert in these various software applications? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, a biased expert. Um, so I mean, to, to, in in, um, in Power BI, you can bring in any data source that you want. But as Becca said, there needs to be the rules engine behind that and how you translate that and what you do with it. Um, and that's what Actaris does with Xero and QuickBooks and a range of other different um, connectors that we've got. Um, the other aspect is the FP&A uh, aspect that Becca's doing. And there's just, there's no other way to write back to a database in Power BI except with Actaris. So they're the two things that are unique uh, in what Becca's doing that you need Actaris for. Um, otherwise, if you've got zero, you could try and get extracts from zero and you can upload them to Power BI. Um, but typically that's manual work and there's things that are lacking. Um, so it's possible, it's very difficult, but it's mostly possible. Okay, thank you. And a couple of questions here that are kind of related. I know we talked about connectors to different accounting systems earlier. Um, any thoughts, Ruben, for a killer or Sage Intact? Uh, Sage Intact, I know for sure, a killer I'm not sure about. Um, but effectively, if that system has any way of getting data out, and the the most basic and the one that's often a fallback is just a CSV export, uh, then we can work with it. Uh, sometimes it's database connections that we can do directly. Sometimes it's API connections that we can work with. Um, we probably worked with it before. Um, and we can work with anything. It just depends on that degree of what's coming from the system and how structured it is. Okay, great. And I, I can see similar questions on other topics as well in terms of, you know, I've seen various systems being mentioned. And I think, as Ruben said, generally speaking, either you can get the direct connectors in or you can do them via the CSV files. So it sounds like there's lots of functionality there. So thank you for sharing that. And Becca, interesting question from from some in the audience here. Um, did you have much knowledge of Power BI? I think it was Steve that sent this one in um, before you started doing this or, or did you kind of have to learn a lot of it on, on the job and, and also working with the Actaris team as well? So my knowledge of Power BI when I started was basically nil. Just before taking this job, I was thinking about learning it. I just thought, you know, I, you know, I, you know, sort of aware of the systems that are out there, and it just seems that Power BI was just getting such um, traction in so many businesses. You just thought, well, it'd be a really good thing to understand. Um, so I was thinking about it, and then this company came along, and then I then did, um, you know, so actually I then built the requirements for this company and did the usual beauty parade, and then of course when I met Ruben and he was talking about Power BI, and I sort of read about it. Um, so, so my knowledge was zero. Now I'm quite spreadsheet savvy. I've got quite good attention to detail. So, you know, I kind of, I'm, I'm fairly logical, but I'm not a systems accountant and I've never used Power BI before. So the way it works is that, and actually through the implementation, there was both, I guess, um, passive learning where, you know, I was working with a consultant, he was doing stuff, he was showing me things and guidance and please do this and go get that data and do this mapping and setting things up for me. But there's also actually, there's a bunch of people um, through the services bit that Ruben was talking about, who are trainers of Power BI. Now you can do, um, you know, you can do like the online learning and stuff, but quite often it can be the kind of stuff that you, it's really hard to get a training course where you want to just learn the things you need to know rather than, you know, 50% of a course you actually know already and you just need the other 50%, but you don't know which it is. So um, 
not very much, maybe only sort of two or three days worth. But through the process over the year, I then got a bit of that one to one training and I just basically come to it and say, this is annoying me. There must be a way of doing it. Tell me, like, how can I do it? Show me how I can do this. And then by doing it in the real world, I then was learning to use it, but with a very specific problem. And I was increasing, you know, enhancing my reports at that in that training session. So it was very relevant to me, it was very efficient, and it was really good learning. And it was just filling in those gaps of the bits that it didn't quite make sense. Um, so yeah, so it was, it sort of it has been from nothing to, and I wouldn't say I'm an expert. I mean, you know, it's like one of those things when you start something, you realize how little you know. So I would say I'm sort of, you know, a fairly, I don't know, even like beginner intermediate user. And yet, so I don't really know where I rank, but you know, there is an immense amount of Power BI that I don't know. And yet I know enough to be able to build new reports. And that's been um, super. Okay, great. Thanks, Becca. And a, a question from Alex. Are you doing all of your FPNA reporting with Power BI in the viewport? Or is that just one of the tools you're relying on to both generate and share the analytics with your wider business? What's the view? Did you say viewport? says view port in the question i don't know reuben do you know Can i think it's just that? asking if um you're using power bi for all of your pna or if there are other tools that you rely on for analytics well and also the access point so so yes we're only using actors power bi for all the forecasting um we're using the workspace so there's the microsoft workspace for business access I'm the only one that actually has access through the desktop version. Um, it just gives me better functionality that I can use and change reports. But yeah, so everybody, um, all the business users go in through the workspace view. They can see the report that I've uploaded in there and then um, they can use all the slices and all the functionality of the drill downs in there to then see the various outputs. Okay, great. And that, yeah, and actually it's that, it's that mechanism that's got the row level security as well. So actually that's the main reason, isn't it? Because of course, if I, if I give them access to the desktop, they'll see everything. So of course, actually the workspace itself is where the row level security sits as well as the file. Sure, okay, thank you. And Ruben, there's a question from Dilnoza about, is there an optimal company size for the best use in terms of startups, SMEs, large, um, or just to add to that, you know, is it about complexity or requirements? What what would your views be? Um, there are two aspects to that. I mean, one is, this is the two kind of distinct product lines. The first one is our connectors, and the second is FPNA. For the connectors, uh, particularly with zero, we've got over a thousand customers using it uh, of all shapes and sizes. Um, typically, more than one entity, but not always. Um, and at that point in time, it's a pretty good cost value proposition to enable better reporting. From a financial planning perspective, it's typically when there's at least three people kind of involved with the planning process. Um, beneath that, there's perhaps not as much return on the investment, but typically three plus people. Um, in the last couple of years though, we've got um, companies across the board. We've got Disney, Heineken, we've got um, banks. So we've got customers with 500 plus users and we've got down to three, four, five users kind of for planning. Um, so it's kind of anywhere in the middle there. Uh, there's no real soft spot. It's if you want to uh, improve the way that you're planning or capturing user input, you want to move away from spreadsheets, you want to move towards Power BI, um, then kind of, you know, any size in there fits through. Okay, great. Thank you. And in terms of the Power BI licenses, I don't know who's best to, place to take this one, but are, are you typically sort of buying team licenses or sort of one or two individual licenses? I guess there's a requirement to both build and generate the reports, but also to share them with people as well. So the free version of Power BI is acceptable until the point you want to use row level security, which as Becca mentioned is basically if you start distributing. So if you don't have a need to distribute to various people with restricted access, you can use the free version. Otherwise, if you do, um, then you'll need the Power BI uh, Pro version, which depending on your region and depending on a bunch of things is between five and ten dollars a month per user. Okay, great. Thank you. So very cost effective in terms of the time savings and a level of manual stuff that would otherwise be required so um thank you for that okay so i think we covered most of the questions i'm conscious that we are flying by very quickly with the time so i just want to make sure i pick up on one or two of the others and um, becca in terms of everything you've implemented I've, I've seen lots of 
inspired comments from the audience so well done you clearly hopefully inspired lots of other people to go and do similar things but what would you say is the one particular thing that you're most pleased about in terms of what you've implemented as part of all of this um I'll say actually that's quite different. So one of the main things is that I no longer dread the changes from the review. It's really interesting. And I, I suspect only accountants who've done forecasting and spreadsheets will understand this. You know, you go into a review with chief exec and, you know, you expect a review to come out with changes. So you, they say, oh, you know, well, actually, that's great. But can you change A, B and C? And you think, you, you know, you smile and say yes. And then you come out and you just go, oh, my goodness. Like I've got to go and find the spreadsheet. I've got to then make the change. And then I've got to flow it all through without breaking anything. You know, get the currency right, other interdependencies, you know, all that kind of stuff. And and I don't have that fear anymore. It's wonderful. So I go, yes. And I go and change the input and I find it. And, and <laughs> so I basically make the changes. You know, and sometimes you can do it in the meeting, but actually sometimes you need to be a bit careful. So, you know, I'll go off and I'll make the change and then make the change in the input press refresh a few times and then teams message the chief exec it's updated have a look on your online report it'll have been refreshed what do you think does that work and and then oh no actually it needs a slight change oh okay fine we'll just change it again oh yeah there we go and it's just so refreshing it means that actually you're not spending time fighting numbers you are doing proper analysis review understanding and they're the so what and it's um, very empowering. Great, thank you. So I think in summary, you're getting the bots to do all the stuff that bots are capable of doing in the current age so that you can focus on the more human tasks. Which Hopefully. Is good, okay. Well, look, thank you. There's so many questions coming in. Apologies, we can't answer them all. I know some of you are probably diving into other sessions now, uh, but just two very quick things. So a couple of you have asked about video recordings. Um, so we are going to be sending the video recording to you all separately. Uh, that will also be posted on the Acteris Grow CFO uh, Partners page as well, just so that you can get a direct link to that and you can find out a bit more about the product, reach out to anyone in Ruben or his team that, that can help you with any specific questions, demos, use cases, etc. cetera. Um, you'll see that we have also established a special offer for the community as well. So I've just put that link in the chat for you. Feel free to go and check that out now. Um, as I say, we will send that link to you and also the video recording as soon as it's available after this session. Um, but I want to finish off by saying a massive thank you to both Ruben and Becca as well today for number one, sharing such great insights. It's great to see so many of you have stayed throughout, obviously been inspired by all those different things that have been heard and um, number two for showing that you know I think most people can do it I know Becca's very impressive but certainly you know with you know that dedication and commitment and really seeing that end vision you know you can absolutely do this regardless of you know the size of your organization your technology proficiency and past experience of Power BI and um, and then thirdly again a massive thank you to everybody for their questions and insights today as well so and we're going to close there but thanks again Reuben thank you Becca and I hope you all have a good rest of your day we'll see you soon thanks so much Dan thanks Becca thanks for the questions thanks all thank you bye bye